Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. By the way, I've solved the technical difficulties concerning bettingangle.us. If you haven't been there for some time, take a look at it now. Anyway, let's talk boxing. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, Errol Spence has had to pull out of his fight against Manny Pacquiao, who is 42 years old, because of retinal problems. Folks, we need to take the retinal problems seriously. We also need to realize that Errol Spence is never going to fight Manny Pacquiao. In my favorites folder right now is a video of a historical fight, right? It's the end of an era. Sonny Liston, a heavyweight I consider a great heavyweight. In other words, just off talent, I know that people are going to disagree with me and that's fine. I think Sonny Liston beats Joe Lewis, right? I think Sonny Liston would beat Rocky Marciano. I know that's not the way the historical record shows it. We know that Cassius Clay, later Muhammad Ali, beat Sonny Liston. We understand the second fight has some controversy, right? But if you look at that film of Sonny Liston against Leotis Martin, a guy who Ring Magazine named one of the 100 hardest punchers of all time, you're going to notice that Liston had one of the best jabs in heavyweight history. Forget that. One of the great jabs ever. You're also going to notice that Liston could throw incredible power shots at arm's length. At arm's length. He didn't have to get in the pocket. He has a better jab than Lewis. He wouldn't have to get in the pocket with Lewis. Right? And of course, you'll notice that punching p power is something you're either blessed with or you're not. And Sonny Liston had punching power. Well, in this fight, and it's the end of the Liston era, I know he fights some fights after this. He fights Chuck Webner after this. But in this fight, he's fighting a very technical guy. The third ranked heavyweight at the time who had sparred with Liston. So Leotis Martin knew Liston well enough to know that he needed to move toward Liston's right hand, even though Liston fought out of a right-handed stance. Right, He needed to move toward Liston's right hand. He couldn't move toward Liston's left in that jab. Even with fighting a great fight, and Martin, for those questioning Usyk, goes into the fight weighing under 200 pounds, right? Again, Ring Magazine named him one of the 100 hardest punchers all time in the sport. Martin gets knocked down by a Liston left hook. That's how dominant Liston's left hand was. Well, of course, Martin stops Sonny. Folks, Liston is knocked down. He's out. Martin comes back in the fight, stops Sonny Liston. It's a special fight in boxing history. It's the end of, we'll call it the Sonny Liston era, because understand, Liston had not lost since losing the Ali rematch, the one involving the Phantom Punch. Well, that's Leotis Martin's last fight, folks. Because Leotis Martin suffers a detached retina in that fight. Understand what that meant in the 1960s. That meant the end of your career. Let me tell you, we thought in the 1980s, Sugar Ray Leonard's career was over because of retinal problems. 
The injury was viewed so seriously that Leonard is out of the ring for years before he decides to fight Marvin Hagler. Years. Look up the record. So I understand we've had advances in medicine. I understand that we've had advances in the technology we use and that several fighters have come back now from retinal problems, right? Abner Maris, for example. Okay, great, I get it. But let's not kid ourselves. Retinal injuries are among the worst injuries you can have. Right, fighters need to think about their quality of life after boxing. Now, Errol Spence is on many people's pound for pound list. Right, he's viewed as a great fighter. He's favored over Manny Pacquiao, even today. Casinos are giving Pacquiao a less than 40% chance of winning that fight. Right, Spence is big time. But Spence has already made big money. Spence has been in the public limelight for years. He's had a number of big fights. If you're Errol Spence and you have at least seven figures in the bank, do you try to continue your career here? Understand the Errol Spence brand is such that if Errol Spence fights again at 147, we're going to expect it to be against the very best, right? We're going to want him to fight a Pacquiao or a Terrence Crawford, right? Or a Jaron Ennis or a Virgil Ortiz, right? Because after all, there's a new generation out there. If he goes to 154, we're going to want him to fight Jamel Charlo, I understand the guys are close, but this is a business. We're going to want him to fight Erickson Lubin. You're going to want to see him in against guys who are going to test him. In other words, Errol Spence is in the deep part of the pool to maintain his brand, his reputation. He's going to have to push himself. Just like Billy Joe Saunders, if he comes back, we're going to expect him to fight tough fighters. Right? Also, you know, recovery has multiple sides. On the one hand, there's the idea of how physically fit is your repaired eye. Okay, we understand that. But then there's the mental thing. Before the eye injury, you're in the ring, you get hit in the eye by Manny Pacquiao or whoever, right? Some guy with a punch, some guy with a snap. You get hit in the eye and you say, okay, I'll give this guy that punch. But you're not expecting to lose your vision. After your eye is surgically repaired, every punch in that eye that has any sting is going to have you thinking about that eye. Right? Mentally, it takes a while to come back. Also, let's face it, this is a tough sport. You have a major eye injury, you're out of the ring. You're not sparring. You're not as sharp as you are when you're healthy and you're always in the gym. Understand, Canelo, for example, is a guy who's in the gym between fights, according to reputation. He's staying sharp. He's keeping his weight around his fighting weight. You take that away from a guy, and is the guy still the guy he was? So Pacquiao's 42. Pacquiao plans to run against Duarte in the Philippines. Right? Pacquiao wants to be president of the Philippines. That's a lifelong dream of his. Let's say Manny Pacquiao then spends time campaigning. Let's say Pacquiao wins that election. Right? Do you think Pacquiao, who has nothing left to prove to fight fans, let's face it, even demanding fight fans, no, Pacquiao has had a whale of a career. 
He's now in his 40s. We can't make demands on anyone in their 40s who has fought as long and as brilliantly as Manny Pacquiao has. Right? Didn't he fight Marquez four times? Think about it. Didn't he fight Timothy Bradley three times? Didn't he fight Oscar De La Hoya? Hasn't he already fought Floyd Mayweather? We know he was on the verge of fighting Errol Spence at 42. So if Manny realizes one of his life's dreams, right, and life is complicated. Boxing's a passion of his, but he also has passions outside the ring. Right, who's then going to tap Manny Pacquiao on the shoulder, especially if he's involved in serious issues in the Philippines, right? COVID, poverty, uh, wealth, inequality. Who's then going to be able to call out Manny Pacquiao from the boxing world? Right, that would be as ridiculous as a fighter trying to call out Joe Biden to hop in the ring with him, right? You know, at a certain point, you realize that Manny next year is going to be 43. And that, you know, Manny's already a Hall of Famer. He doesn't need to fight anybody. So forgive me, I don't think the Errol Spence, Manny Pacquiao fight ever happens. I know they're trying to put a happy face on it. Understand, they always try to put a happy face on major situations. You know, Calvin Brock fought Vladimir Klitschko for the heavyweight title. Calvin Brock, according to reports, is blind in one eye. Lehman Brewster fought Vladimir Klitschko for the heavyweight title. Lehman Brewster, according to reports, is legally blind in one eye. Antonio Margarito's eye that got busted up, ironically, by Manny Pacquiao was never the same. Ishmael Valdez's eye, busted up by Rafael Marquez. I believe he lost the eye, ultimately. Right, so they can put a happy face on this. They can tell you that some fighters made it back from retinal damage. Right? Look closely at Errol Spence. Just ask yourself basic questions. If you were young, well, Errol Spence is younger than me. I understand he's older than some of you. But if you were young, if you had money in the bank, if you had name recognition, such that a lot of media outlets might want you in the booth commentating on fights, or a lot of promotional outfits might want you associated with them, or boxing managerial outfits might want you associated with them because young fighters view you as the top shelf because you, when you had to walk away from the sport, were unbeaten. Then ask yourself if you're going to continue your career, right? Because we understand that the eye is now less than perfect. It can be surgically repaired. But you understand that a put-back-together eye isn't the same as a 100% healthy eye. Right? There's a physical component. There's a psychological component. I can tell you, I was once in a car crash. Man, every time I was by where that crash took place, even when I wasn't thinking about the crash, my body started tingling. Right then, then I would think, then I'd say, oh, that's right. It's around here where I was in that car crash. Folks, that went on for years. Right, think about it. Well, let's talk about Ugas. Let's talk about Manny Pacquiao. Understand, here we're speculating on styles. Right? I'm someone who believes you have to think for yourself. While I was committed to taking Manny Pacquiao over Errol Spence, because I thought 
Spence was going to try to keep Pacquiao outside. I thought Pacquiao was going to be able to dodge Spence's jab. Right? Pacquiao beat David Diaz, folks, who was a southpaw. The champion at 135. Right? I haven't seen Manny Pacquiao struggle against a southpaw. Right? I thought Manny Pacquiao was going to slip Errol Spence's jab. I thought Pacquiao was going to be too sudden for Spence. I looked at Spence's recent fights. Those weren't on par with prime Errol Spence. Right? I thought the Errol Spence of the later rounds, in a fight in which he's losing the early rounds, against Cal Brook, was prime Errol Spence. I thought Spence was going to be at a hand speed disadvantage. I thought Manny Pacquiao was going to be bouncing around. The idea of Errol Spence getting inside after Manny's debacle against Jeff Horn and roughhousing Manny to me was not going to happen because Pacquiao now is a different fighter. Also, according to reports, Manny Pacquiao was looking spectacular. Spectacular in sparring, right? He knocked down, apparently, multiple sparring partners. As for those of you who believe that Manny Pacquiao doesn't have the power at 147, all I can say is, look, understand, he drops Shane Mosley early in the fight. Early in the fight. Then Mosley's in survival mode. Manny Pacquiao is riddling Chris Algieri knocks him down several times in the fight. Chris Algieri had to dig deep to survive. Also, there's the political component. If Manny Pacquiao looked good against Errol Spence and the fight went the distance, do you believe the judges would rob Manny Pacquiao? Visually, the smaller man. Visually, the man with blinding hand speed. Visually, the man with better legs. So I thought Manny had an advantage on Errol Spence. What I want people to do, because it's a very important fight, this is one of those psychological tests where we could all watch the fight together and leave the room with vastly different opinions. In my favorites folder right now is Ugas against Sean Porter. Right now, just like I'm here telling you that Sonny Liston was far better than advertised. I know he doesn't have the body of work, but in my opinion, he is one of the top people in the heavyweight division. Put differently, Joe Lewis is at ringside for the first Ali Liston fight. And Lewis hops in the ring and he's doing some of the interviews. And Lewis, before the fight, openly talked about how Liston was one of the best heavyweights of all time. Right? Lewis, a puncher, understood that Liston's jab was a game changer. Liston's power from outside was a game changer. That Liston beat some very tough mandatory contenders, very tough fighters, Cleveland Williams, right? Liston just comes inside and demolishes them. Well, Ugas, and I know he has some losses, but in recent years, the only loss he has is the Sean Porter fight. Now, you know Porter, and you know how Porter gets low, and you know how Porter is episodic. What I want you to do as you look at the highlights in my favorites folder is look at Ugas's left hook to the body. That's what I want you to do. This is a tale of two fights. This has shades of Hagler Leonard. In other words, Sean Porter's accessible, just like Ray Leonard's accessible. You see the fight, you see what Porter's doing. He's jumping in, he's throwing one or two punches, you know, he's dramatic, he plays to the crowd. And you say, oh, Porter won this fight, or Ray Leonard beat Hagler. Then you actually watch the fight and you look at Ugas's body work. 
Folks, that left hand to Porter's body, I've watched a lot of Sean Porter's fights. He's never been beaten up like that to the body. Look at Marvin Hagler's work to Ray Leonard's body. Understand that Hagler was the middleweight champion, a long-time reigning champion. Just ask yourself whether anyone who does the body work of Marvin Hagler against Ray Leonard should lose their title. I'm not saying the fights weren't close. What I'm saying is that you look at Ugas, and the more you look at Ugas, the more you realize how talented he is. He's a master of timing, right? I know he's a tall guy who leans in the pocket, but folks, he knows what to do with his head, right? He moves his head. Look at his head. I want people to look at Ugas's head against Sean Porter. And look at how Ugas has the timing down to where when Porter jumps in the pocket, Ugas does not even have to cover his head. This is a dangerous man. My advice on the Pacquiao-Ugas fight, knowing that Ugas, in my opinion, dissects Sean Porter. Understand, in the 12th round of that fight, Ugas clearly scores a knockdown on Sean Porter. The referee rules it a slip. Jack Reese, the same ref from the Tyson Fury-Deontay Wilder fight. The ref rules it a slip. Had the ref ruled that a knockdown, the fight on the scorecards would have been a draw. Right? In my opinion, there's no way, watching the flow of that fight, watching how Ugas figures out Sean Porter, figures out his timing to the point where as low as Sean Porter gets, Ugas is repeatedly landing body shots. Also, you'll notice, too, the first part of the fight, and this is a scary guy. This is when you're dealing with the ringer. The first part of the fight, you'll notice that Ugas figures out his left hand. The last third of the fight, you realize that Ugas figures out his right hand. There's a learning curve here. So Ugas then starts leading with right hands. Power shots. He can lead with it. He can throw it as a counter. Now, one of the things with fighting Manny Pacquiao is... Pacquiao's explosiveness, his speed, blinding hand speed, great feet, low center of gravity, he can get low, Manny Pacquiao is sudden, just like Sean Porter's sudden. But understand, we've seen Ugas dissect a sudden fighter. Also, there is the issue, and it needs to be mentioned here of the second half of the Keith Thurman fight. Now, I thought Pacquiao won the fight, but I need for you to look at the second half of the Keith Thurman fight. Folks, Thurman makes a comeback in that fight. Right now, there is the issue of whether Ugas could make a comeback, even if he's down early against Manny Pacquiao. Right? So, for me personally, and I'm not risk averse, right? I was in the water with Manny Pacquiao in his quest to beat Errol Spence, right? When I heard the opening line of a plus 350, I thought, wow, it's Christmas. Had no hesitation betting on Manny Pacquiao. Even hedged the play with Spence by KO. Folks, I'm hesitant on this fight. I don't have a good enough read. Right, Ugas is the guy who you see and you understand. There is more here than meets the eye. Right, if you're a basketball fan, this is like looking at Cory Booker. He scores 70 points in a game. You say, okay, was that a one-off or is this guy that guy? Then you notice him in the finals, he's struggling a little bit. After all, they have guys like Drew Holiday on him. Then suddenly you see enough where you realize that 
in a series with Giannis and others. This guy is clearly, when he's on his game, the best scorer on the court. That's Ugas. Right? Let me just say, I know he has a bunch of losses. I know if you go back in his record, you're going to say, who's this guy who beat him? Right? Understand, this is that guy. He's in his mid-30s. Right, folks? He's a technician. That scares me. Pacquiao's already dealt with losses to a technician in Marquez. Right? We remember the first Eric Morales fight. That's a fight where Pacquiao is controlled by a jab. Right? Elite guys with technical skills who aren't relying on physical gifts, who don't have to be the better athlete in the ring. Because the guy has the techniques and strategies and learning curve. Think Bernard Hopkins. Those are the guys who will have me hesitant. Folks, I'm hesitant here. I'm not betting. It's a must watch. I think it's a great fight. For me personally, it's a more intriguing fight than Pacquiao Spence. I'm certainly going to watch. Pacquiao Ugas, but I'm not betting on it because, in my opinion, Ugas is a ringer. Ugas is a guy who can offset a Sean Porter's explosiveness. Right? A Manny Pacquiao's explosiveness, possibly. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you have a distinct preference and you want to share it with the boxing community here, since I'm hesitant, since I'm punting on the fight, if you want to share your thoughts in the comment section, or if you have a video up on YouTube and you want to put a link to your pre-fight video on Pacquiao Ugas in the comment section of this YouTube video, then please feel free to do so. Share some insight. That's how I see it. Thanks for stopping by.